Um, so you can go ahead and start recording. So understanding the symptoms and the wide range of symptoms that occur post who aren't even aware that they're etc have anything to do with the traumas they experience. And when the evacuation occurred, uh, we opened our clinic doors uh, over three consecutive Saturdays. Is that right? Three consecutive Saturdays. It was still in town. Come in. We put it out on social media. And it was intense. Uh, one Saturday, I think it was the second Saturday, we had 18 people come in who had been through all the tragedies that you can imagine or may have occurred to you from the mudslides and the fires. 18 people on um, one, one Saturday. Fortunately, we had staff there to handle it. The mudslides and the fire were just this, this domino. We would start to symptoms and about other traumas that may have been triggered from the mudslides and the fires. You, you around the traumas that happened earlier on in these people's lives. And uh, the connection was, was profound. Some people are, are really resilient with trauma. Some people, they're up and out. But other people, it sticks with them. And I'm going to explain why that is in a, a few slides down the road here. And grief and anxiety fit in with trauma too. They all have similar pathways in the brain and have similar effects. So hypervision, you are aware of everything going on around you. Even when you sleep at night, sometimes you're aware of all the noises that are going on. You're aware of what's going on in all the rooms. When you go to a movie theater, you know everybody who's sitting around you. You become hypervigilant. And that's nightmare, obviously. Nightmares, guilt, <coughs> poor judgment, poor memory, intrusive memory, survivor's guilt, flashbacks, hyperstartle reflex. Is anybody, uh, is anybody familiar with that, hyperstartle reflex? Hyperstartle reflex is a brain mechanism designed to what? Protect you, to keep you from being startled, to keep you from being uh, attacked from where you go. Spent many, many years in prison. How many years? Like more than half his life. He was in his 50s. And one of the first things that he was able to um, experience from the treatment was a disappearance of his startle reflex. And his startle reflex was his safety. That's what kept him safe. When he would see a police car, he would go under a car or over the bushes. So when he realized that we had sort of taught his brain to remove that startle reflex, guess what? He wasn't happy about that. <laughs> so you have to understand that some of these responses there is a protection for the brain. Uh, apathy, poor concentration. And a lot of these, particularly poor concentration, poor judgment, poor memory, these have to do with a, a chemical called cortisol, which some of you are probably familiar with. It's a stress chemical. And when you're under a lot of stress, your body starts to secrete a lot of cortisol. And um, it's a great chemical because it's anti-inflammatory, but it starts to impair parts of the brain that have to do with judgment, memory, and concentration. The, if you've ever had your cortisol levels checked, you're looking for these, these peaks in cortisol that should go throughout the day and then a later peak at night. What, what tends to happen with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is the cortisol peaks go away eventually. And you get on the verge of the verge of adrenal burnout and you're in trouble because recovering the adrenal glands function is quite a project, which we'll, we'll talk about here. Isolation, health feelings or feeling numb. All symptomatic of post-traumatic stress. Trauma impacts us. You have to do a little uh, neuroanatomy here, okay, just to give you an idea. So, our brain is constantly experiencing an interaction process between three levels. 
highest level of your brain, the most evolved part of the brain, the neocortex has many of the other uh, animals on this planet are neocortex. Thought, abstract thought and language, and we really like using our neocortex. <laughs> the second level is called the mammalian because it's, you remember that old um, phrase, our brain is recapitulating or, or that happened in evolution. So yes, we have this neocortex that makes us human, but we also have a mammalian part of our brain called the limbic, limbic brain. And this is where, then below the mammalian brain, below the limbic brain, is the reptilian or primal brain. Sometimes we call it the crocodile brain. That's the part of us that is purely reactive, purely instinctual, uh, runs on instincts, driven by hunger, reproductive drives. It's also temperature control. If, if, if you have anybody you do a fight with over the thermostat, it's usually a hypothalamic issue going on. Um, respiration and heart rate, the fight, flight, or freeze response is also what occurs down in this, in this region of the brain. This is an extremely important part of the reason why, because it, it is what literally keeps us alive. When somebody uh, is, goes into a coma, for instance, and you know they might say that they have um, lockout syndrome, so the cortex, for all intents and purposes, is not functioning, can't communicate with the people, with the person. Some people in coma need to be on a respirator, some don't. But this part of the brain, if it is still functioning, will keep that body alive, even though for all intents and purposes, that person really isn't there. This also happens to be the part of the brain that is dominant in the infant. You know, the infant is really uh, in that primal brain. It actually takes quite a while for these other areas of the brain to connect. The limbic brain connects fairly soon, within a few years, and then the neocortex may not fully connect until a person is in their 20s and 30s, particularly in the frontal lobes. So these, these areas of the brain, from, from top to bottom, are constantly talking to each other. They have to, they have to communicate. How they communicate is chemical, but it is also electrical. These areas of the brain communicate through uh, brain waves. Brain waves are the signalers. They carry information. They say, you be active, you be quiet. You go to sleep, you wake up. And what we know now is that these are the motivating factors in behavior, particularly in the limbic brain. If you look at um, politics right now, particularly right now, the cycle of politics, you can pretty well tell what the, the primary manipulation emotion is now, right? Anybody? What? Fear. Fear. Right. That's the motivator. So fear is coming from a lot of rational thought being used to motivate behavior. Even marketing and selling techniques are really not, in fact, there's studies that show that when you think you're going by the limbic system here, because this product's going to make you look better, it's going to make you feel better, it's going to make you happier, and so on. Not a lot, a lot of rational thought goes into it. What neuroscientists are fond of saying is that the mammalian and the limbic brain and the reptilian brain hold the neocortex hostage. Like this, this, this is really what drives our behaviors. It's pretty rare for us to be able to move away from these. And the reason is because these parts of the brain are all about survival. So, the limbic system. The amygdala is a little almond-shaped uh, structure in the temporal lobes. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. The amygdala's job is to process the significance of events 
as seen specifically through a biological lens. How is this event related? And the amygdala uh, is primitive. It is all about survival. 20 million years. It's a long time. Structure. Along with the amygdala is the hippocampus. It's the hippocampus's job to store memory from short term to long term and then connect that memory with feeling reactive. How many people saw uh, Christine Ford's testimony? Yeah. Did, you, did you hear what she said? Yeah. Boy, she did her homework, she did. didn't she? She said, that event was imprinted in my hippocampus. I was like, yes, <laughs> you said it. Awesome. And, uh, and she said, she said you know, nor norepinephrine or noradrenaline was the chemical. That's exactly what happens. Remember details, you remember smell. More often than not, it's the traumatic events that you remember to the letter and it is imprinted in and by the hippocampus so that you never forget it. Why? So it doesn't happen again. Very simple, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The hypothalamus is extremely important because it's the hypothalamus that controls the ANS, which is the acronym for the autonomic nervous system, the body's balance system. The autonomic nervous system has two portions. The sympathetic portion of the autonomic nervous system speeds you up, gets your adrenaline to, to flood your system, and the parasympathetic slows you down. Very simple. All day long they're doing the seesaw. But when you're under a lot of stress, the hypothalamus keeps triggering the autonomic nervous system and specifically the sympathetic. So the sympathetic starts to do this sort of step up, 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 and your hands get sweaty and your blood pressure goes up and your digestion suffers and all of a sudden your doctor tells you you have all these issues because the parasympathetic portion can't keep up with it. It can't quiet it down and slow it down. That's part of the stress response. Ultimately what happens is an autoimmune break with this kind of a cascade of issues. So there it is. That's the amygdala. 20 million years it's been on this planet. A little organ. This is the, the frontal lobe here. Uh, this is obviously a, a, a section, the brain cut open. Frontal lobe, temporal lobe, ears around here, and the posterior region, the brain top, the brain eyes. So it's in here, kind of above in the front of the ear. That's the culprit. <clears throat> the, the amygdala becomes the century for the rest of your life when you have a trauma. And what, what I mean by century, it becomes the guard. It becomes the notifier. Once a trauma has occurred, doesn't matter what age, the amygdala says, okay, for the rest of your life, I'm going to warn you. Unconsciously, don't worry, I'm gonna work in the background. When you are in, some, in, a, in a particular place, or with a particular person, or in a particular situation, that is reminiscent of this trauma. And it records that very clearly. Then it tricks your brain. The trauma actually changes the architecture of the brain. Do you remember when um, the uh, immigration at the border was psychologists, developmental psychologists got on TV, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. But I remember seeing one interview on CNN. And she said, you realize that when you take a fire That's what happens. The architecture of the brain literally changes. Networks in the brain begin to scramble in an attempt to create protection. So you've taken this five-year-old child's safety away. What, are the, what is the rest of their life going to be like? They're never driven by an attempt or a search for safety and security. There's a, def there's a part of the brain, it's actually a network, it's called the default mode. The default mode is your autopilot. The reason you don't have to think about starting your car and pressing the gas pedal and pressing the brake 
and drive you down the road is because the default mode network in your brain, in your brain handles all of the operations. Um, you've all or 25 exits go in between. Well, that's the default mode network. Just the brain likes to conserve energy. And if you can sort of go to sleep during the day and go into default mode, you kind of don't have to think a lot. And your brain is conserving energy. The problem is that brain network gets tricked into thinking trauma is happening in the present. It's if anybody in here has a fear or a phobia or some of the flashbacks of the what is happening in that moment? Your default mode network is tricking your brain and it is saying literally, that's happening now, not a year ago, or not depending on the trauma 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. A great example is guys coming back from the military. You know, they're and they, you know, they see horrendous things, their brain goes into a 24 hour a day hypervigilant response. Their amygdala says, boop, you gotta pay attention because your sniper could get you or an IED could go off. So when they, and their brain has been tricked to believe that the trauma is happening in the present. That is literally what happens. Primary goal for working people through trauma and for repairing some of these networks in the brain is to unlearn that response to trauma. Because it's pretty deep, it's dug in there, but it can be unlearned. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have been through trauma therapy, but we know now that there's a problem with focusing too much on trauma history. Sometimes it's called re-traumatization, but it's probably not the greatest idea. And I'm citing uh, some work being done at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, with the Wounded Warrior Project. The Wounded Warrior Project has been going on for, I think, six years now. Post-traumatic stress disorder and concussion. The is, is, guess what? Neurofeedback, yoga, meditation, and therapy that is not based on traumatic history. It is based on forward-looking, forward movement. So they, they decided to change the, this was the normal course, let's do systematic desensitization by having you talk about the horrible things you saw. They realized it wasn't working. It wasn't working. So they said, let's try changing this a little bit. Let's get off that. Let's work on simply teaching the brain and the nervous system to unlearn that response to trauma. Now, I don't have anything against systematic desensitization. I used to do it for uh, fears and phobias. It can work great in some cases. But this other way seems to be working better. And again, according to the uh, physicians at Fort Lyon, I'm sorry, Fort Campbell, um, they're having a 90% success rate with these guys in six weeks. Dissociation states also uh, occur with the traumatized person. And they have to be uh, carefully observed because oftentimes when we're dissociating, we don't even know it. We don't even know that it's happening. And that usually takes a professional to point out to the person who's undergoing a dissociative state. And there's really what's happening with the dissociative state is the person is associating with the trauma and dissociating from their own feelings and memories. I mentioned earlier uh, when I talked about the clients that so after the mudslide, that some of the of the clients who came in who witnessed horrendous things, experienced loss, were quite resilient. They really just kind of got together and, and moved on. Some really were profoundly trapped in a stress response and a fear response. And just like I said earlier, their brains were really being tricked into this is happening now. So what we found when we looked at this was that there was a correlation with something called ACE. And is anybody familiar with ACE acronym? No. So ACE stands for A for adverse, C for childhood, 
E for experiences, adverse childhood experiences. So between the age of zero and seven years old, a child's brain is like a clean slate. Yeah, there's genetics that are there that are gonna create propensities towards certain likes and dislikes and behaviors and so on. But environment has a huge influence on that child's brain between zero and seven. It is imprintable. So what the ACE test is, and the ACE test began back in the 80s, so there's a lot of research now about the, uh, the ACE test that, um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So the ACE test measures 10 types of trauma. So number one is personal trauma, and it's very simple. Uh, it's, it's 10 questions, sometimes 11 or 12 questions. But you just say, did you, you know, you answer the question, did you experience any physical abuse? Did you experience any verbal abuse? Did you experience any sexual abuse? Physical neglect, emotional abuse. In your family, was there a parent who was alcoholic? Was there a mother? Did you ever have a family member in jail? A family member with mental illness, also along with that, a family member who was handicapped? Um, or a family member who had another challenge? I don't fit autism into mental illness, and I think that should be included there. And finally, <laughs> Is there, was there a disappearance of a parent through death, divorce, or abandonment? So you take the test. If you have a score of three, that's considered significant. If you have a score of six or seven, that's highly significant. And if, if you decide to go home and search this tonight, there's some awesome research, longitudinal studies showing the higher the ACE score, the higher incidence of substance abuse, depression, panic attacks, and cancer, and heart disease. So the, it's kind of like, um, you know, we, we, we can't push this stuff aside. This is what is creating children uh, who are either going to be severely challenged when they start to go into the world, or if we can learn to recognize it, we can change it. There is a push now in California to do ACE testing at uh, with pediatricians. So the pediatricians uh, give the family a test or the difficulties moving through trauma are people who have high ACE scores because the, the high A scores set them up. What all this does, again, going back to the brain, is it, it creates a state of insecurity, a state of unsafety. This is not a safe world to be in. You can't predict anything. And if, and if you don't protect yourself, if you don't get into the survival mode, something here is going to get you. And then throughout life, because that is a brain architecture problem, your brain is going to respond to situations from that perspective, okay? So, what to do? This, these two words, be present, have become way too cliche and over, overused. But you know what? It's one of the most powerful techniques and practices we could possibly do. How many people have read um, Eckhart Tolle's book, Power of Now. Awesome book, if you've never read that book, write it down, Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. The whole point of the book is how to be present. How to get out of this brain default network that wants you to live in a memory of a of past, basically. How to get out of that and to be present to be in the moment. Easier said than done, but it can be worked on. Trauma derails this time-keeping part of the brain, and being present helps to bring that back. You struggle with it. You wake up in the middle of the night, and you're sitting there, oh, 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 and you're going through all of the perturbations and reviewing the trauma, and what can I do about it? But just remember, the trauma is not happening in that moment. The key is to, to keep pulling your brain back into the present moment. This is, this is a struggle because those deeper regions of our brain do not want to be present. 
They want to stay out of the present moment. They, they sort of yell, yell at us because they're trying to protect us that it is not safe. Neurofeedback. Um, I've already had several conversations with people here and I, um, I don't think I've ever been with a group of people where uh, so many were familiar with neurofeedback. So this is very good. Neurofeedback is real-time brainwave feedback. Allowing the brain to stabilize and experience the calm of the present moment. And I'll explain that more in a few minutes. So number one, neurofeedback, if you're not familiar with it, is non-invasive. Uh, no drugs are used, no chemicals are used, nothing is going into the individual's brain who is doing neurofeedback. Simply what is happening in the process of neurofeedback is we are measuring the brain wave activity of the individual. The brain wave activity is analyzed, is um, looked at for potential problems or issues. Are there stress manifestations in this person's brain wave activity? So we, we go through a whole process and then we determine how that person's brain needs to shift to break out of these patterns if they are in fact traumatic. And the way that the shift occurs is quite interesting. It's just through feedback. You give the brain a signal, a visual cue, an auditory cue, sometimes even tactile. You give the brain information when it is moving out of stress patterns, when it is unlearning those stress responses. And over time, what happens is the brain learns how to turn that amygdala off. It learns how to turn off the messages that it's getting from within itself that this is unsafe to be here. <laughs> Neurofeedback is based on the principle of neuroplasticity, which has been around for about a decade now. Neuroplasticity just simply means that your brain is plastic. It is you know, the old myth that your brain was what it was, and that was it, and you were doomed to entertain thoughts of depression and anxiety and anger and fear. Guess what? Same thing happens. Those parts of your brain get bigger as well. The brain is neuroplastic. It is going to accommodate to where your thoughts go. So it's a very powerful concept when you understand it. <coughs> you utilize it to a great degree. Neurofeedback helps to retrain the brain to release the fight, flight, or freeze response. Let me just say one thing about the freeze response, because most people hear fight or flight, fight or flight. You know, in other words, your body is being prepared to fight the attacker or to run away. The freeze response is far more deadly. The freeze response is when you have lost all hope and your system starts to shut down. You, you, you are in a corner. All hope is lost, you don't know which way to go. So hopelessness, helplessness, sometimes called learned helplessness. So this is actually sort of a, um, when the fight response is over being overtaxed and the flight response, your brain and body will automatically go to freeze. It goes to this hopeless, helpless state. It's very dangerous because that's when the system starts to really break down. Neurofeedback will help quiet the autonomic nervous system, helps the brain and the nervous system to unlearn the response to trauma, encourages harmony, among those three levels of the brain that I showed you earlier, because it stayed, remember I said, maybe you remember or not, but those parts of the brain all communicate chemically, but electrochemically. So it's the brain waves that are regulating those, regulating those three levels of the brain. There are numerous published studies and papers out now on neurofeedback's efficacy for PTSD, anxiety, and many, many other disorders. If you want references, just let us know. You can email us. We can get them for you. or show you where to go. I keep mentioning Fort Campbell, Kentucky. This is really a groundbreaking uh, program that they have going on there. Um, as I said, using neurofeedback plus a few other modalities. So these are brain maps. And I'm just showing you these because they're a rather dramatic example of how the brain can change. 
Um, and I don't have to explain in great detail what they all mean, but once you understand just a little bit, you'll see why this is so profound. Each vertical row corresponds to a particular bandwidth of brainwave activity that's at the top of the row. I don't know if you can see uh, this from way back here, but this says delta, beta, alpha, beta, and high beta. These are the slowest frequencies of brainwave activity moving up to the fastest frequencies of brainwave activity. All of these bandwidths indicate something very specific that is happening in that person's brain. So this is as, as if you're looking at the person's head from the top down, that would be the nose, left ear, right ear, and each little dot is one of the electrodes that we use when we take recordings. It's called brain mapping. Um, so this row corresponds to something called absolute power. These are the horizontal rows. This is called relative power, amplitude asymmetry, coherence, and phase lag. For our purposes tonight, I just want to talk about this top row and absolute power. Uh, there's a color key here that um, correlates with the brain maps. And you, if you remember your statistics class in high school or in college, uh, what these maps are of is this individual's EEG, his brainwaves patterns, compared to a, a normative database. So we're taking somebody's EEG and saying, this is how you compare to quote unquote normal brains. So you can see that um, anywhere that it's white, Two standard deviations is yellow, three standard deviations is orange, and then above three standard deviations, which is considered a big outlier, so big problems, is um, red. So you can see from this map, this, this person has problems, obviously, wouldn't you say, and if you understand what high beta is, high beta is, a, is high frequency activity. It is cortical hyperexcitability. That, that, that individual's brain, that individual's brain is, is at hyperspeed. And it's an uncomfortable hyperspeed. It's the brain trying to accommodate. And this particular individual, this was also uh, a former criminal. Many, many years in prison, multiple brain injuries, and significant post-traumatic stress disorder. He also had profound vertigo. What else? Headaches. Headaches massive like everyday headaches to the emergency room headaches and his vertigo was falling down Funny character when um, he first came, right a rough, rough, big guy. And uh, I said, you know, I looked at his, I looked at this, and I said, have you ever, have you ever had a, a head injury? And he, uh, all of the staff was around him and he said, I have won every fight I've ever been in. <laughs> I said, all right, I want you to write down for me this weekend every time you think you've been knocked unconscious or hit or been in a fight. And he came back with two pages. Of uh, stuff, everything from motorcycle wrecks to gang fights and so on. So anyway, um, 
So this is, this is neuroplasticity. This is how much the brain can change. Because this is true, some of this is, is, is real uh, damage. And, and remember what we're actually And all I wanted you to see is the severity index, which was 4.08. After the, he went to the treatment, it went down to 2.75. So 4.08 post treatment, 2.75. Now, um, along with neurofeedback, uh, I don't want you to think that I believe by any means that neurofeedback is a standalone. Uh, modality. We often combine it with other modalities that we feel are compatible um, and particularly for trauma. Some of the most, these are what I would consider to be the most important modalities that I think everybody who has had trauma should look into. Number one is somatic therapies. The body keeps the score. If you haven't read this book yet, get it. The Body Keeps the Score, written by Bessel van der Kolk, an awesome fellow out on the East Coast. He um, wrote this book detailing trauma, how trauma locks up the body and get, literally gets locked into the body, and that you have to remove it from the body. There's also an excellent chapter in here on neurofeedback. He's a huge advocate of neurofeedback when combined with other therapies for trauma recovery. Really recommend this book. Uh, EMDR, how many people know what EMDR is? Good. Okay, lots of people. Eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Some EMDR therapists don't use eye movement anymore, they use tapping. But another technique that is wonderfully compatible with neurofeedback, and when we see that, when we combine some of these modalities, the effects are exponential. I'm a huge advocate of meditation. I've been teaching meditation for 35 years. I was taught uh, meditation in the Kriya Yogic tradition by a, a student of Paramahansa Yogananda, who some of you are probably familiar with. So I'm in that tradition of Kriya Yoga, and in teaching meditation for 35 years, I think there is, is no more powerful technique than meditation. And don't tell me I can't meditate. <laughs> you can learn how to meditate. Meditation is not something you just sit there and all of a sudden can do. It's something that has to be learned. Meditation is self directed neuroplasticity, pure and simple. Meditation is self-directed neuroplasticity. You are sitting there, you are meditating, you are using the focus of your mind and your thought to build those parts of your brain that you want healthy and to quiet those parts of your brain that are unhealthy. Breath work, guess what? If you want to be present, just pay attention to your breath because your breath is always present. So there's lots of breath therapists and breath, breath treatments around who people who do different types of breath work. But um, I won't go too deeply into it, but it is, it is one of the most powerful tools that you can use to get your body to start releasing trauma. Exercise is extremely important, more for your brain than your body. Uh, mindfulness meditation is a wonderful meditation practice to work on this notion of being present. We also highly recommend moving meditation in the form of Tai Chi, Yoga, Hatha Yoga, Qigong, and Reiki. Reiki is a, obviously not moving meditation, but some of the energy power of Reiki, and some of, if you've ever been to a Reiki therapist, can be quite remarkable in quieting the, the nervous system. Obviously, trauma and grief counseling and therapy, and acupuncture also has a remarkable effect on the nervous system as well. Okay, so we did it. <laughs> and um, it's a rare thing for me to get through all that in this meeting. So I want to—I really want to open the floor to you now, and uh, if you have questions, uh, you have the mic. So yes, ma'am. I'm quantitative EEG is the main modality that you use to diagnose trauma, like traumatic brain injury. Yeah, QEEG. We use S. Uh, we use Loretta, 
RED is an acronym for Low Resolution Electromagnetic Tomography. It is the closest thing to using MRI. And um, I, I know Robert Thatcher who created it, and in my opinion, in my 35 years, it is the best thing out there. And how does that compare to, let's say, a PET scan? Uh, uh, well, they'll show you different things. Glucose, blood flow, SPECT scans will show you different things too. And, you know, the Amen Clinic, and Daniel Amen wrote uh, books right here, Change Your Brain, Change change Your Brain, Change Your Life, which, speaking of Daniel Amen, I highly recommend this book. They use SPECT scans. Look for different things. Um, sometimes the SPECT scans are used to figure out which medications might be uh, most beneficial for those clients. So EEG shows you something different. Uh, MRI and, and, and CAT scans, PET scans, you know, they're showing you some specific tissue issues, blood flow, oxygenation, and so on. Do you ever feel the need to do both? Do you have more sometimes, yes. Yeah, sometimes we'll send people down to Newport Beach to get a spec scan. I am not, um, I am not, you know, I'm into complementary medicine, alternative medicine, but I'm not anti-medication. I've seen it save people's lives in, in acute situations, but when I worked in the psychiatric hospital, our goal was to get people on minimal doses of medication, and if we can, get them off the benzodiazepines, and teach them as much coping and self-regulatory skills as possible. Yes, ma'am. Um, you were mentioning that um, family gamma rays can focusing on the trauma and the trauma that they should yeah, but the, it's a therapeutic process. Okay. When you do EMDR, you're talking through it and you're desensitizing the body's reaction to it. Okay. What I mean by re-traumatizing is what Christine Ford went through up there in front of those, those that committee. That was brutal. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you got I couldn't watch that. It was just unbelievable. That's re-traumatizing. Anybody else? Um, sure. How long in the middle of the night your brain replays? Yeah. I mean, it happens in your brain, but it's just when you wake up in the middle of the night and you worry about something that's messing with other things. Yeah. What causes that? The default mode network. The, <laughs> the default mode network of the brain. Mm -hmm. We call it endless loop thinking. And what you'll see in a person's brain map. He didn't have it, but what you will see in a person's brain map quite often is excessive beta activity, fast activity. See, the back of your brain is a filing system. It's not supposed to make judgments or decisions or, or really have anything to do with that. So this back part of your brain, if, you, if it is too active, when you go to sleep at night, it's going to run through scenarios over and over again. And the problem is the solution does not reside in that part of the brain. The solution resides in the front part of the brain. But what, what's happening is the back part of the brain is usurping that energy. There's a book written called The Breakout Principle. And it, it's, it's kind of like what grandma used to tell us. It's like, if you have an issue that you can't solve and you're ruminating on, you're doing endless loop thinking, get out of the situation, go for a walk, go for a hike, do something unique. And what will happen is your brain will shift out of that endless loop and change to the front. So sometimes that's what you have to do. You have to pay attention during the daytime. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. You were saying something about autoimmune disease and yeah. trauma and um, loss of what you were So the trauma in, in the long process causes a breakdown in the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. There's a researcher from Caracas, of Venezuela, named is Fouad Leshin. F-U-A-D, less L-E-C-H-I-N. He found, really mapped out, he was a cartographer, he mapped out the pathways in the brain that, that begin to break down and end up resulting in autoimmune failure. And most of his treatment of autoimmune failure was based on very simple manipulation of neurotransmitter levels, not giving chemotherapy, not giving corticosteroids. Extremely successful. I studied with him for a while, and I found that we could do the same thing with neurofeedback. 
So I'm not saying we can go out and, and cure lupus and so on and so forth, but we can certainly um, quiet those autonomic nervous system activities that are precipitating autoimmune breakdown. Um, I'm very sorry for